So hello, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Um, very nice to um, be uh, present at this uh, uh, very nice event organized um, by Bio Atelier um, today. Um, my name is Franz Nivelle, and I'm actually the Chief Communications Officer of eBrains, and very happy to be your host today. Um, we're going to have um, uh, a very interesting session, I hope, um, with um, key speakers um, who will be addressing you and, and sharing with you how they've been using eBrains and uh, what eBrains can do for you in your research. And of course, there will be time for questions um, uh, at the end of the presentation, so don't hesitate. Before I um, uh, give the floor to our experts, let me uh, maybe very quickly uh, take you through a few, just a few items regarding eBrains. Um, eBrains is, as you probably know, um, a European research infrastructure. A research infrastructure, I'm sure this audience is very familiar with the word, um, but this is actually something that Europe is um, uh, very much encouraging and um, putting at the disposal of the scientific community in order to foster research and development and innovative research in Europe. So these are tools that are really at your service, at the service of research uh, provided to you by Europe. Um, what sometimes happens is that uh, those research infrastructures are well kept secrets, um, unfortunately, um, and um, what is very important is that we make the best use of, of, um, of everything that is at our disposal. eBrains is digital, meaning there is no one location where everything happens. Um, it's a digital platform and the services and tools are provided by different uh, universities across Europe. Um, so it's very much an online uh, tool and um, a federated tool. It's open, meaning it's accessible for free. Um, and it's also collaborative, meaning it's not uh, carved in stone once and for all. It will continue to develop, to develop with users, bringing their expertise onto eBrains. And I'm sure uh, my colleagues will, will show you examples of this. eBrains is also on the S3 roadmap. This is another piece of European jargon. All in all, what it means that it's been listed on um, a roadmap established by um, a European authority that lists actually the research infrastructures that are best in class and uh, as useful as possible for the scientific community. So in a sense, this is a kind of um, quality stamp. Um, it's a collection of integrated tools, data, uh, models, and um, this will be explained in more details by our speakers, um, but it's it's an extensive uh, palette of uh, tools and data sets that uh, people can use and that researchers can use for their research, and it participates and supports participation to funding call applications, be it uh, European calls or national calls or private calls. And we're currently involved in uh, several of those calls. Now, eBrains doesn't fall from the sky. It actually comes from uh, the work of the HBP. Uh, the HBP is the Human Brain Project, a flagship uh, project sponsored by uh, the European Commission, about 1 billion euros invested in, in the research. Um, a research project that lasted 10 years. This will end this year. And it involved more than 500 top researchers, 150 academic institutions across Europe, and um, um, paved the way to uh, more than uh, 2,600 scientific publications uh, so far. Um, so as you see, the, the basis of eBrains is quite solid, um, and it's not just something that um, you know, emerged from nowhere. And eBrains uh, really wants to be a bridge between scientific theory and neuroscience theory, let's say, and uh, health applications. So we, what we want to do is really enable this uh, transition from um, uh, theoretical research and um, applied research. 
um, and uh, for this, the various tools that we are offering and that will be described uh, in more details um, are very much um, there to help and to enable uh, brain health breakthroughs. So this was in a nutshell to put you a little bit in the eBrain's atmosphere. Um, and we are very lucky today to have uh, four true experts, you know, uh, talking to you uh, and making the time to talk to you um, to tell you how what eBrain's is, how it will develop, but also how they can, uh, how they have been using eBrain's and how you could be using eBrains in your research. And the first of these speakers is uh, Victor Gersa, and I think we are going to get uh, the introduction slides if I stop sharing, I guess. Um, yes. Uh, did you get the rights back, Yerkana? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, Victor, Victor, who's with us, uh, Victor whose uh, CV is like, I don't know how many pages long, so I'm not going to go through this, uh, but just telling you that um, he's the director of the CNRS in, in France, but also director at the Institute uh, for Neuroscience Research in um, uh, Marseille, uh, has been contributing uh, to um, the virtual brain research and theory. He's been a leading figure there uh, together with uh, Petra Ritter, in a, who will be also talking today. Um, and he's an expert in everything that deals with computational, computational uh, neuroscience. Um, Victor, this is a very short summary of your profile, uh, but people will realize, you know, all um, the, the, the good things about you in your presentation. I forgot to mention that you're also the Chief Science Officer of eBrains. And as such, I uh, give you the word. Thank you, Franz, uh, for this very kind uh, introduction. And uh, good morning uh, to everyone. And um, I'm start sharing my screen with you. Go in presentation mode. So it's a pleasure to speak to you today. I was asked to give an overview, an introduction to eBrains, maybe a little more depth. It will remain uh, superficial within the time. Address uh, words on uh, uh, the scientific vision and the mission that we have at eBrains and uh, give you a few examples, but uh, uh, this will be just use cases. Um, of uh, how we can and wish to operate in eBrains. So, as Franz uh, said, uh, eBrains is the key or one of the key deliverables of the human brain project that comes to its termination uh, this year, in fact. And eBrains, uh, over 10 years, has, uh, sorry, a human brain project. Uh, over the 10 uh, years of its existence, it has had a threefold mission to advance the understanding of our of the brain of uh, neurosciences to translate this novel understanding into brain medicine and to build brain inspired and today I think we can say brain derived uh, technologies using this understanding. This is inherited by eBrains and um, the eBrains mission, uh, I, I'm breaking it down here, foremost is to provide a unique digital research infrastructure for brain sciences, uh, which is in support to provide a framework in which world-class research in fundamental neuroscience can be performed. But there, uh, this is, uh, think of it as an ecosystem in which you can do the type of research uh, that you typically could not do in an isolated laboratory by itself. So it brings also communities together to push the frontiers of sciences and technology for the benefit, uh, health and technological benefit of the society. So um, how do we do this essentially? We, uh, uh, at, as a, a, a guiding vision, eBrains advocates the integration and interoperability of data, tools, and uh, models. 
And uh, if you look at this, if you break this down, data, tools, and models, these are realizations of our knowledge that we have in uh, neuroscience. And when we put these elements together and integrate them yeah, together in a fully coherent uh, ecosystem, we create essentially added scientific uh, uh, value that can actually uh, not formulate it in any other way. Uh, I will show you an example. Uh, what you see here on the bottom right represented is an access to brain uh, dynamics. Uh, just an example from epilepsy, for instance, where we are sampling a brain activity using intracranial measurements, in this case, stereotactic EEG. And uh, hypotheses can be formulated on uh, the organization of the epileptic seizure uh, in this particular case helping to estimate and identify the origin of the epileptogenic uh, uh, seizures, the so-called epileptogenic zone here represented in blue. Yeah? Through the data, you have access to certain areas, yeah? which means you do not have access to the other areas because they were not implanted. Through the process of integration in eBrains, essentially, uh, you have the capacity to extend your view uh, to the entire brain and other areas that are not being sampled directly by the accessible data. And this uh, goes uh, by means of linking the data to causal models yeah? uh, and to uh, methods that can actually optimize this coherence between data and models and through this actually extend the uh, view, the computational view and interpretation of the data and you have access to the identification of potentially other epileptogenic zones. In a current ongoing tr clinical trial, this type of uh, methods um, that have been developed in the Human Brain Project and are available in eBrains now are actually being tested and in retrospective patients uh, it turned out actually that 29% of the zones in and uh, inaccessible through the data uh, turned out to be predictive for the epileptogenic zone of uh, individual patients. So it does matter. Yeah? This is just a very concrete example in order to set your mindset. Yeah? The way we do um, uh, this integration in eBrains is by building a federated network of interoperable services. The services are being provided by academic service providers. This integration as uh, um, I just showed you, allows us by linking model and data to uh, enhance the computational view accessible by the data. It allows us to create unique data sets through this integration that could not be integrated otherwise, or very often large cohort data due to heterogeneous sampling, there are uh, essentially missing data in there. Through this integration, uh, it is uh, possible to complete that type of data sets and on, in the spirit of personalized medicine, we can actually build highly multimodal data sets that it would be impossible to obtain otherwise and which uh, moves forward the front, the forefront of uh, personalization of diagnostics and therapy. Yeah? So um, through these uh, 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 platform, and uh, accessibility to the entire neuroscience community, we are enabling essentially the scientists to build fully customizable workflows. So you don't have to follow individual workflows um, uh, that are provided in the ecosystem of eBrains, but the way it is tailored, you can actually go through the system and build your own workflows tailored to your personal scientific questions. Something that through the fusion of data and model becomes also possible is uh, the use of digital twin uh, technology, which has actually uh, originated in industry and manufacturing and has been a very important uh, way of uh, building flight simulators or NASA is using this uh, uh, to uh, plan their individual flows. And uh, what, what we can do here in this particular context is build appropriate workflows to test 
for instance, uh, uh, patient interventions or patient diagnostics. This allows us to develop th new therapeutic uh, uh, approaches and test also novel neurotechnologies that Peter will speak about later. Yeah? And another uh, element equally uh, important is actually the building and running and sharing of brain-derived technologies uh, for which actually the ecosystem of eBrains is uniquely suited to support this. Yeah? So when you look at the number of services that are available, there are several and I would like to go actually through them um, and uh, later on provide some examples of their uses. So there are uh, five services based on data, atlases, simulation, the use of brain-inspired technologies and medical data analytics. Yeah? The first one in terms of data and knowledge, and I believe Petra will speak about this in more detail uh, later on, is dedicated to the curation of data, render them available, share them, render them findable, and link them with appropriate other tools through adapters in order to make them accessible in the community and map them uh, on individual uh, computational models and software. For this, we need an appropriate space in which is this re represented, and that is the Atlas space, which is another key service provided by eBrains. It is available for the human, for the rat, and for the mouse. Other Atlas services are in uh, development, and it does actually integrate the data in an Atlas space, allows the query of the data through appropriate interfaces, and actually um, uh, pull out the data together in the shared space with the appropriate model parameters or individual tools, allowing you zooming into the individual areas and actually querying and analyzing the data in Atlas space. For the simulations, there are um, several simulators available, and this is another traverse of scales that we can actually perform in eBrains, from the microscopic to the mesoscopic to the macroscopic scale. There is a nest simulator available as a representing no point neurons allowing to build microcircuits, arbor or neuron to allow to build very detailed, morphologically detailed neurons, or the virtual brain allowing to build full-scale brain networks all enhanced by other uh, software that is uh, in support of the individual uh, simulator ecosystems and actually providing the appropriate backends. Um, embodiment is a very important element in neuroscience. A brain is embodied in a body which uh, acts in an environment. This requires experimental task representations in a virtual world, especially if we want to drive forward the digital twin. So we need uh, physics simulators that allow us to stimulate the brain, for instance, uh, implant the individual uh, stimulators, or embed the cognitive architecture into a skeleton or in a body and allow actually navigation in this space. So physics simulators are in development and do exist in the uh, um, uh, eBrains ecosystem. Data will uh, play, uh, data in particular, sensitive data play a key role. Petra Ritter will speak about this in more detail. There are two uh, unique eBrains platforms within the eBrains ecosystem. This is a medical informatics platform which actually allows to unpack uh, eBrains in a box behind the firewall on this uh, hospital site and allows in a very reduced fashion to treat data in a fully conform environment on the hospital server or uh, was specific servers are being provided in order to enable this. There is a special space dedicated to human intracerebral EG data in which on different li layers of uh, prioritization and security, individual data can be uh, uh, treated, also using eBrains uh, tools. Nothing works without uh, the appropriate backends, the computing and the storage services that are in particular provided by Phoenix and the five supercomputing centers that are supporting the Human Brain Project and subsequently also uh, the eBrains. 
and the collaboratory and interface uh, uh, to operate uh, the eBrands platform that is represented here. So putting all this together in individual workflows from data model software through high level professional curation, making the data and the models operational uh, and findable, uh, treatable, analyzable via the knowledge graph and linking it to the individual tools. This is how we can actually build the individual, individual science workflows. Yeah? And one thing I wish to emphasize here, you will find many other projects and also in other research structures in, in which this type of uh, uh, collaborations are occurring. But if you look very carefully, all of them are bilateral or bivariate. What we are having here is a multivariate environment where the inter-environment for the uh, inter-scientific value chain has been rendered interoperable. And this is where eBrains is uh, unique. At the core is a brain reference space in which actually the data are across scales represented in the same space, ranging from the full brain regional space uh, to the subcellular details all the way down to the big brain atlas space uh, on a scale of 20 micrometers. In the same space, when you query the uh, individual brain regions, you can actually, as you see represented here, access the uh, molecular the cellular data and have full parameter distributions either over cortical depth or probability uh, density distributions which are then being mapped directly on the parameters of individual models providing us with the ontology yeah? and uh, across the different modalities you see a vertical axis represented here um, uh, parsing across scales cannot be done only across data but it can be done also through the uh, simulators and here for this, you have to actually either uh, interoperate them. You either focus on one scale or you have to develop interoperational capacity also across the individual uh, simulators. And this is something that has been developed over the past five years. Uh, that's relevant because the different simulation engines use actually different entities for processing from firing rates to uh, spike rate uh, uh, to spike rates to individual action potentials and detailed LFPs. Yeah. Here you have an example that is coming from Michele Migliero's lab, uh, collaborating with Javier de Felipe, uh, allowing highly resolved, uh, very rare data to be accessible in eBrains with electron microscopy reconstructing the cell bodies of the human hippocampal network CA1 region and then tracing out the axonal and dendritic arborizations, translating this into uh, mathematical probability clouds that you then can actually operate and start computing the likelihood of connections and build individual representations of the CA1 region that you then can actually simulate in a three-dimensional physical space for the human. Very unique and individual data. When you scale it up to the full brain network, you can actually go from the individual neuron to populations, as you see represented here. And then today we are at about 300,000 vertices that gets us in the sub millimeter range, where actually the data coming from different sources like uh, highly resolved connectomes, highly resolved cortical data being merged together in the same space. And you can actually start constraining your models and providing very unique data sets, which is actually the foundation to perform the type of work that Peter Rolf Sema is doing by testing different technologies, sensors, what do they measure for uh, validation, as you see represented here in this region of the temporal lobe. Um, so that allows us to build actually the scientific value chain I was talking about, getting us from the human through the data, the brain reference space of functional, structural, multi-scale data, allowing us to build individual digital twins, depending on the scale that you want to have, yeah? and actually even mixing scales and adding, feeding in your own data, and then actually asking your customized workflows, simulating them using the back-end infrastructures and making predictions either on cohorts, or on the individual patient brain. We refer to this as the eBrains knowledge loop, 
which is a representation, a closed representation of uh, this scientific value chain. It's fully supported by the organization and topology of the infrastructure from the data that are uh, that are in the Atlas services findable being through uh, adapters here, Zebra, linked to the individual models and the, the uh, uh, parameterizations of the models, yeah? linking to the underlying backend, being supported by this and merged with high-end and uh, state-of-the-art validation and inference software in order to get back to the individual origin of the sources, which is the data. So this is how we have actually designed the topology thereof. So let me stop here. I touched only upon some of the use cases, but I wanted to give you an idea of the breadth of the capacities that we have in eBrains, and I hope it was useful. Franz, back to you. Thank you very much, Victor, and uh, thank you for this uh, great overview of what eBrains can offer, I'm sure. Um, this will raise a lot of interest and, and uh, questions, so don't hesitate to ask your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, uh, we'll be very happy to go into more details. Um, and now, um, uh, following this and linking to what you've been saying, Victor, we're going to have the pleasure to listen to Peter Rufselma. Um, so, Giagana, if we can get, yes, thank you very much. So, Peter, uh, Peter is another uh, expert um, within the eBrains and uh, the Human Brain Project. Um, he's a professor at uh, Amsterdam University um, and um, uh, specialized actually in uh, specializes his research um, on uh, visual perception, uh, plasticity, memory, and consciousness in the visual system. So. Um, uh, a lot of uh, in-depth research into uh, how uh, neurons uh, work at different levels in the, the visual and thinking processes. Um, Peter is also an expert in neurotechnology, leading the Dutch neurolo neurotechnology platform and very much involved in the neurotechnology uh, group uh, that eBrains has uh, put together. So. Peter, uh, we're very happy to listen to you. Thank you, Franz. So let me just share my screen. <clears throat> um, now, let's see if this works. Can you see my screen? Great. So thanks, Franz, for a very kind introduction. So today I would like to share some new information about how eBrains uh, is also supporting neurotechnology. So the reason for the interest of many scientists and eBrains in neurotechnology is that we are facing a societal problem regarding mental health and neurological disease, which are likely to become the largest medical and societal cost in Europe in the next uh, few decades. And this is combined with an insight that pharmacomolecular approaches are, are not super successful. So actually companies are deinvesting or have been deinvesting over the last years. So something needs to be uh, developed that is different. And also there has been a lot of progress in previous years in the field of neuroengineering. And um, actually, we believe that advances in the management of, of many of these diseases are within reach. And I will explain in my presentation why we believe, why we believe this is the case. <clears throat> we are not the only ones. So this is from the OECD Science, Technology and Innovation Outlook from 2016, who pointed out 40 key technologies. And of those 10 that are making most progress, shown in blue here, and listed among those were the neurotechnologies. Now, why is this? Well, the capabilities of, of researchers and medical doctors to interface with the brain, as you also have seen in, in the presentation of uh, Victor, are rapidly expanding. And the reason is that there are improvements in chip technology, but also uh, electrode materials, for instance, flexible electrodes new artificial intelligence methods that allow us to read from and write to 
the brain at increasing resolution, new ways to also assess the user experience of people who are uh, living with the brain prosthesis. And this needs to be combined with a ethical framework because uh, directly interfacing with the human brain and maybe also getting insight in somebody's thoughts, of course, is not without any ethical uh, concerns. So that is also quickly developing that framework. Now, there are many use cases uh, for which neurotechnology is being developed uh, at different technology readiness levels. So in the world, there are about 40 million people who are legally blind. I will say something about that today. But there are also many people who are deaf, about 450 million around the world. And we all know about cochlear implants. Cochlear implants are good for, for recognizing speech, but they don't give the full auditory experience that people without deafness have. There are many reasons for people to be have a motor problem, paralysis, about 100 million people in the world. And uh, a last use case, Victor talked about it, is epilepsy with uh, about 50 million people in the world who are affected by, by diseases causing epilepsy. Okay, so there's a huge societal problem. Now, neurotechnology requires a highly interdisciplinary approach. So here on the side, you see some of the use cases I alluded to, there are more of them. And here are some of these difficult technologies or different technologies that people are working on. And of course, scientists, and I, I for me, that is also the case, like to talk to their direct colleagues but it doesn't work for neurotechnology because you have to go all the way from chips to artificial intelligence to understanding how, how a, a prosthesis is appreciated by the subject and ethics in combination with all the technologies and, and the neuroscience that we work on. So we need to break down those barriers. Okay, and that is what the eBrains uh, neurotechnology platform is all about. Now, eBrains gives a lot of uh, of platforms that allow scientists, including those interested in neurotechnology, to take advantage of. Victor already alluded to many of them. So data and knowledge, atlases, very important if you want to develop a prosthesis, simulation tools, brain-inspired technologies, me medical data analytics. So we need all of these features to build the next generation of brain prosthesis. Now, what we're seeing here is a rapid development. In the 1960s, people started to probe with single electrodes in the brain, starting to understand how neurons process information. And now we're rapidly expanding the number of channels with which we can write to or read from the brain. And uh, this is expected to, to increase further in the near future, thereby also improving the, the experience of people with brain prosthesis. Now I'm going to give you one use case <laughs> because that's something I work on myself that is easy to talk about. And that's blindness, which has an enormous impact on an individual's life. So it gives rise to a loss of independence and actually quite a high probability of unemployment. I think people who are blind have threefold more chance of being unemployed than people who are normally seeing. And there is an increase of other medical problems and I said that before, about 40 million or more people in the world are legally blind. And that, actually, that number is, is, is growing quickly. Now, here is the way that information reaches the eye and the retina is then transported to the LGN, which is a, a structure in the thalamus, and then projected onto the primary visual cortex, which is the structure I'm going to talk about. Um, and the um, many people who are blind actually, they uh, they lose the connection between the eye and the brain. So there's some of the prosthesis work in the eye, but of course, for the majority of patients in which the connection between the eye and the brain is lost, that doesn't make any sense. So you really have to make an interface with the neurons in the brain. Um, so we are, or we have been targeting primary visual cortex, so which is the at the back of the brain, it's the first cortical stage for visual information processing. Now, if you put an electrode in the brain, just a wire, then and, and you stimulate those, those cells uh, with a little bit of current, then the person, and this can also hold for a person who has been blind for several years, 
sees a dot of light. Now you should realize that primary visual cortex has a map of the entire space. So if I if I place my electrode at one location, the subject is going to see a dot of light here. If I displace the electrodes by a few millimeters, the dot, dot will also be displaced. It's a very systematic mapping of space outside in the outside world onto uh, a two-dimensional sheet of cortical neurons. Okay, so if we place many electrodes in that map of space, then of course we can create many of these dots of lights. We call them phosphenes. So if you have 1000, you can create 1000 phosphenes. Now the trick is to not stimulate them all at the same time, but only switch on a few of those phosphenes so that you can create patterns of light, just like a matrix bar that you might know above the highway, right? If you light up a single light bulb, you see a dot, but you can create meaningful patterns by flashing up many light bulbs at the same time. So that's what we are doing. Or that would be the aim to do that in, in, the, in the perception of somebody who has been blind. Now, this is what such a system might look like. So the user of the prosthesis is wearing a camera. So there, there's camera footage that needs to be processed. And so that can be, do, be done using artificial intelligence. And then this picture of a person could be presented to the brain as a phosphine pattern. So I hope you can recognize this as the outline of a person. We would like to send that information wirelessly to a brain chip that is then connected to electrodes that are going to activate the appropriate set of neurons. And so that's how it would look like in the future. Now, I would like to show you that we demonstrated a few years back proof of principle that this can work. We tested it in monkeys. <clears throat> and in these monkeys, we implanted more than 1,000 electrodes. And these electrodes were actually coming in arrays. Every array in our implant had 64 electrodes. And the electrodes looked like, these electrode arrays looked like sort of beds of nails. <clears throat> so at, um, they were made of silicon, so-called Utah arrays. And at the tip of every electrode is an exposed part of metal. And that is where you can steer the current, activate the neurons. And this is what it looks like. So this was implanted on the skull of a monkey. So this protrudes through the skin. <clears throat> and every black rectangle here actually is one of these electrode arrays. You, you now are looking at them from the top. And this is work that has been done by, by Singh Chen in my lab. Um, so this is how we implanted these electrode arrays. So each array has 64 electrodes. And so they're implanted mostly in primary visual cortex. And um, we can then map out if we um, stimulate one of these electrodes, where would this phosphine occur? Now this at zero, zero is central vision. And we implanted the electrodes in the left hemisphere. So we get all the phosphines in the right lower quadrant. That is just how this map works in, in, in the macaque monkey. And so if we stimulate one of these red electrodes, we get phosphines close to central vision. If we go to array number four, we get these yellow phosphines. If we go to array number five, we get this light green phosphines and so on and so forth. So basically you see here the layout of the map of visual space on the cortex in this, in this picture below. We replicated that in a second monkey. And now I would like to show you uh, data while we were stimulating one electrode at any one time. And these small green circles indicate all those locations in the outside visual world where we could produce a perception. And what is going to be shown as a larger circle and in white is the electrode that we're active, actually stimulating. In uh, magenta, you see the, where the monkey is looking. Okay, so we start, then we stimulate one of the electrodes and the monkey's task is to make an eye movement to the location where he perceives something. He starts the trial by looking at the red plus sign. And then you see when you stimulate one of the electrodes, he's going to make an eye movement there. So this demonstrates that we can indeed produce those single dots of light in the visual field of a monkey. Now that had been shown before, but in this study, we were able to do this for hundreds of electrodes, which was in some sense a new record. But scientifically, maybe not super interesting. The big question was, does this matrix board analogy that I was talking about, does that hold? Can we indeed produce patterns in the monkey's perception by stimulating multiple electrodes at the same time? Okay, so we trained the monkeys on a task in which they looked at a fixation point, just the red dot. 
Then we presented a letter on the screen in front of them. And then we presented the choice menu and the task of the monkey was to make an eye movement to the letter that they just saw. Okay, that has been done before, not super spectacular. But now the exciting part of the experiment, in the exciting part of the experiment, we don't present a sample anymore. We just activate a set of electrodes in the primary visual cortex. We know where we expect those phosphenes. And from these phosphenes, we then build up, or we try to build up the perception of a letter, hoping that the animal will then later choose the appropriate letter from the choice menu. Okay, and this then shows you one of these experiments. So again, every green dot is one of the locations where we in principle could produce a phosphine. The ones that we are activating will be shown in white. So we try to produce letter L, and yes, the monkey is making an eye movement to the letter L. It was the letter O, and so on and so forth. So I think still looking at it is quite spectacular. So we were very excited to get this result. It shows that it's indeed possible to directly convey form perception by stimulating multiple electrodes in the primary visual cortex, giving proof of principle that indeed such a visual, uh, or such a visual cortical prosthesis could, could actually work and create rudimentary forms of vision. So this is just showing proof of principle. So this matrix board analogy works. And it's interesting that in a collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Eduardo Fernandez, who works in Spain at Algia University, we have been able to test this also in a human participant. So this is uh, Bernadetta Gomez. She's actually a co-author on the paper. She has been blind for more than 15 years. And uh, Professor Eduardo Fernandez and his team implanted in her one of these electrode arrays that we tried in the monkeys, only one, so she, and she had 10 by 10, so 100 electrodes. She also had this pedestal, so that was screwed down to her skull, and this connector was protruding out through the skin to make the electrical connections. And this is how the neurosurgeons implanted this electrode array. So it was implanted in primary visual cortex in the back of the brain. And it had, here you see these close to 100 electrodes. Okay, now the good news is when they started to stimulate patterns of electrodes here in the shape of a large square, uh, Benedetta said, I'm, going, I'm seeing a large letter O. And when they uh, stimulated in this in the shape of a small square, she said, oh, I'm seeing a small letter O. So that was very, very exciting for us. <clears throat> it was not always super predictable. So when they stimulated with these two small squares, she reported seeing a letter I. Well, okay, maybe you can make an I out of it, but it's maybe not so obvious. <clears throat> and for this pattern, she saw a letter L. And this was not predicted by us. So what is going on here is that these electrodes, uh, differently from the monkeys, are all in a very small region. So we do expect a little bit of interference patterns here, and that might, might explain why she sees a letter L here. Okay, but in general, it seems that it, it replicates the results that we obtained in the monkeys, although we spread the electrodes there over a much larger cortical region. region. And I hope you can uh, hear this. So this is Bernadetta who kind of tells us about her experience during this experiment. Okay, so this gives you an impression 
of what the user experience is and she only had 100 electrodes right so it's definitely not a medical treatment it's just an experiment that demonstrates that this can be done now i would like to end with a small movie that gives you the impression what it be what it would be like to look through through such a visual cortical prosthesis so you can simulate this and that's what we're doing here so what you see here is a virtual reality system and on it we mounted the camera and we use the same processing pipeline as we would normally do for the visual cortical prosthesis but now we just uh, present those as visual dots in the virtual reality environment so try to uh, recognize what you see here in this in this movie So this is this is what it would look like so it's not comparable to human vision okay now now you get the sense of what you're supposed to see right so the quality of vision is, is still very poor uh, we're thinking about 1000 electrodes maybe we'll go to 10,000 electrodes and there's there's way to go and there are many technical problems also to be solved but i think with um with this eBrain initiative on neurotechnology, and this is just showing one of the applications, we will make great progress in the near future. So we leverage the groundbreaking advances that are currently taking place in this ultra compact electronics and powerful computation. And with that, I would like to thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, so interesting and fascinating to see you know, what uh, the potential of neurotechnology can be and, uh, you know, opening new horizons for, for the future. And this is, uh, this is great. Thank you very much. Um, we're now going to listen to Petra Ritter, um, who's another one of uh, eBrain's uh, experts. Um, we are very lucky today to have, you know, four experts with us. Um, and Petra um, is um, works in Berlin at Charité uh, University Hospital and at the Berlin uh, Health Institute, where she is a full uh, professor. Um, and she is um, uh, in charge of um, brain simulation in the Department of Neurology at, um, at uh, Charité. Uh, Petra uh, is everywhere, you know, uh, she's been uh, very active in, uh, together with Victor, in developing the virtual brain theory. Um, and she's received um, so many grants from uh, um, the European Commission, but also other grants. Um, she's involved in uh, many uh, research projects. Um, and one of the key elements uh, of, of the research today is also the necessity to deal with uh, sensitive data um, in order to advance research, because uh, there are limitations today with what we can do with, um, with patient data, uh, when it's absolutely essential uh, for researchers to, uh, to be able to work with uh, such data to, uh, to enable breakthroughs. So Petra, I'm sure you will uh, tell us more about uh, your research and, um, and how you think we should go about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Franz, for this really very kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I will now uh, share my screen and we will see um, whether this works for you because this is a new system. Is it the full um, presentation mode or is it the presenter view that you are seeing? It's a full presentation mode? That's it's great. Presenter view. Ah, okay, then let me just try to switch it. Okay, I don't... Well, let me just stop for a moment and then I will try it again. Okay, second try. I think now it looks already here better. How is that? Yes. Very okay. good. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and it's a 
great pleasure to be here and to share with you how eBrains contributes to the future of brain health in Europe. And we have seen many very inspiring examples already. I hope that I can continue the same way. You have learned about the possibility um, to build digital twins of human brains indeed now. So human brains uh, obviously are very complex systems and eBrains enables their user community, yeah, um, academic users, but also um, users from the private sector to integrate data and build such digital human brain twins, which is fantastic but it's even better that we can simulate uh, those brains. And we not only can simulate them, but we have learned we can personalize them. Yeah? We can really create brains, uh, digital avatars of individual patients or uh, also healthy uh, persons. Here you see just one example of a brain avatar of one of my colleagues, Jessica Palmer. So all the tools that are necessary, yeah, um, to uh, do this kind of research are being provided by eBrains. eBrains has now uh, more than 6,000 registered users, and you have already received an overview of the different service categories that are being uh, provided uh, by eBrains. Um, I want to show you how they are all connected. Yeah? So the, the beauty of eBrains is that there is interoperability. Um, the services can understand each other, they can work with each other. And this is a very complex drawing, but what you see are many connections, yeah, these arrows. And they indicate to you that the different components that have been created by different people in eBrains are working together. They understand each other. So for example, here in this column, you see the core services provided by eBrains, high performance computing, yeah cloud computing um, or a so-called knowledge graph. So this is a graph database where all the metadata, the annotations of the data are being stored. And uh, it has interfaces, programmatic interfaces and uh, also graphical user interfaces so that users um, with their individual preferences can search the data and tools and uh, models in the system. But there are also other components uh, that you see here. So for example, uh, I am involved a lot in the development uh, of the virtual brain uh, simulator. You have seen before, and the blue boxes here represent different tools that are required in order to create such digital individual uh, twins of, of patients, for example. And they have been integrated. Yeah, The arrows again show there are many connections. Uh, there are different forms of deployment, uh, as you will see in a minute, you can directly run these services in the cloud. We have uh, very high data protection standards <laughs> because we are dealing here with personal data yeah? and uh, not even personal data, but health data, which is a special category of data according to the general data protection regulations of the EU. So we need a very high um, level of uh, information security and data protection. This is provided by um, encryption, yeah, cryptography um, technology, by sandboxing. So when the data are being processed, they need to be decrypted. And during this period, they are isolated. Nobody can access the data and this protects them. But there's also very strict access control. Yeah? Uh, so it's uh, clear that only authorized people can access the uh, sensitive data. So let me give you a couple of um, examples what uh, this diagram um, uh, contains. Yeah? We have heard about workflows, processing workflows, and these workflows are being um, completely digital and automated and reproducible. Yeah? We use uh, uh, Docker container technology even for very complex multi-stage uh, processes for example, for processing multimodal radiologic imaging data to then construct from the many different modalities the ingredients that we need to run meaningful personalized simulations. <laughs> and here you see just a couple of um, examples um, how we extract information yeah, with these Docker container workflows that are available for all users 
and that can be fully automated and of course also modified and adapted to the individual workflows. The amount of such workflows is increasing over time so that there's a nice repertoire of solutions already available that can be utilized for um, the scientific uh, questions of the individual user. Yeah, and here you see that we are also dealing with functional activity. Yeah? When we are doing simulations, we have to compare the simulated activity with uh, functional measurements. And also this needs to be processed. So the container pipelines, uh, since they are fully automated and standardized, they can process large amounts of data. And there we benefit from the um, several high performance computing centers in the back end of eBrains. So for example, we can process large cohorts like the UK Biobank cohort or the Human Connecton Project cohort with thousands of individual brains. And they're all processed then in a standardized uh, way and can be compared. But we can also process, as you can see here, damaged or unhealthy brains. And so this is a particular challenge because normally <coughs> the, the standard pipelines and workflows fail with such, um, uh, let it uh, call uncommon brains. So for example, here you see a massive uh, stroke lesion and uh, the, uh, to process such a brain and to generate um, the derivatives of the data that are needed to run meaningful simulations, you need um, specifically adapted pipelines. And these pipelines are, are also existing and made available to all researchers. Um, you've heard about the simulators. Here, this is, for example, the virtual brain simulator. This is a software that was already developed before eBrains started, but now it is integrated. Yeah? And, and the value um, immensely has been increased because um, you can, for example, run simulations in the cloud using the infrastructure. You don't have to deploy or install the software on your own computer, but you directly can run simulations in the cloud just by starting the software with a single sign-on. If you have the credentials of eBrains, you can directly go there and run the simulations. And um, these simulations are very useful because uh, they, for example, can make the researcher infer processes that cannot directly be measured. Yeah? So we have certain observations, for example, non-invasively recorded functional activity of a brain. But with the help of the theory and the underlying mechanistic model, we can infer the data that cannot be measured. Yeah? Here you see a simulation of an individual, yeah, Jessica, whom you have seen previously, during so-called resting state, when she is doing nothing for 20 minutes. And from this simulation, we can infer from each individual brain region, for example, the firing rates of the excitatory and inhibitory neurons. And this is something that one cannot measure non-invasively, but with the help of the model and a lot of information that is accessible, um, we can build predictions of the behavior of the hidden uh, variables, like the firing rates of inhibitory and excitatory neurons. Um, let me give another very concrete example, multi-scale co-simulation. You have learned before that it's possible to integrate or connect different simulators. The virtual brain simulates the whole brain at a relatively coarse scale, but there are simulators that, for example, simulate individual spiking neural networks, and they can be plugged in the whole brain model and simulated together. So now we can see how the global more coarse activity influences, for example, plasticity in spiking neural networks. That's very important to know. <laughs> and this can be used in turn uh, for the benefit of patients. Yeah? So for example, um, deep brain stimulation and Parkinson's patients um, requires a very good uh, localization of the electrode in the patient brain. Yeah? And sometimes it's really difficult given the pattern of symptoms of an individual patient to take a decision, what is the best way of uh, stimulating um, the subcortical structures of these individual patients. And we have uh, some proof um, uh, of, of principle um, already that these multi-scale co-simulations uh, help to better design the best uh, stimulation. And why is it important to have 
multi-scale co-simulation here because we want to see really the details of the spiking neurons in the subcortical structures. But what also often plays a role are not just neuronal activities, but also the molecular cascades and the protein pathways yeah, that are changed in certain brain diseases. And what we see here is a PET scan yeah, that measures protein um, uh, concentration of pathological proteins, uh, for example, in Alzheimer's brain. But we have the measures also available for healthy controls. And uh, by integrating this protein distribution and the brain, we can simulate uh, activity of these brains and how they change if there is too much of the protein. We see a slowing compared to the normal um, fast uh, rhythms of the brain. And this can be seen when this protein is added as we can measure it in Alzheimer's disease. And indeed, these Alzheimer's disease patients have such slowing in their EEG. So we understand really how the different observations yeah, are being linked together mechanistically. And we can use the simulation inferred uh, information yeah, that to increase the feature space. I've shown you how we can infer the firing of neurons, inhibitory neurons, excitatory neurons that we couldn't measure. This is information that we can add to a feature space. Yeah, this is a feature space here. And we have shown that for dementia, uh, increasing or enriching the feature space with simulated um, uh, parameters increases the predictive accuracy. Um, also, it is possible to use now these brain models for silico drug testing. Uh, we can apply NMDA antagonists, for example, that are used in dementia, and we can invert the um, slowing. Uh, here you see the slow activity in the Alzheimer's disease. But now we also have the opportunity to look for the mechanisms because we have the model and we can use our mathematical tools to understand what is the mechanism yeah? and what are the critical points um, that we have to reach um, to achieve a certain effect in the patient. Um, another example of interoperability is linking the virtual brain with the digital atlases that have been mentioned before. Yeah, here you see, here we scroll through the receptor densities that are being provided by e-brains in uh, standardized reference spaces. And these pieces of information can be just added, as you can see here, to our brain models and they increase the biological detail of our models because they introduce the heterogeneity yeah, that changes again how the dynamics evolve in the brain. And this is very important additional information as are the pathways and cascades that are changed in brain diseases. There are pathway inventories, and these pathway inventories uh, listing, for example, cascades that are linked in Alzheimer's or also in epilepsy and Parkinson's disease can be linked to the individual brain regions, and we can then simulate the effect those changes have on the global dynamics. And um, at the end, I show you an example where we couple the virtual brains uh, to effectors. Yeah? Uh, we can couple the activity, for example, to the robotic platform. This is a simulated uh, robot and see directly how the dynamics in our simulations affect, for example, motor activity. But we also can use um, advanced mathematical tools to see why, for example, um, people perform differently in working memory or decision making. Yeah, we now really can understand using complex dynamical system theory why these changes occur. And we understand the principles and rules underlying cognition in humans. So in summary, we have now many possibilities and eBrains uh, provides these possibilities to the entire research community. Uh, it's not some privileged researchers who have developed the tools, but it's the entire community that can utilize this um, uh, technology and this common knowledge to better understand the mechanisms, the mechanisms of brain function and dysfunction to um, better um, reach uh, diagnostics or predict the trajectories of uh, diseases and to test in silico um, interventions and therapies and patients. At the end, I also want to mention quickly that we take information security and data privacy very seriously in Europe. We have secure processing environments 
that offer a lot of technology to um, process all these data securely and according to law, and the law. We have the health data cloud. Yeah, this is something that is under development that uses the secure virtual research environment technology to build a federated system so that the data from Oslo University Hospital, from Charité in Berlin Hospital, or from Zurich University Hospital, that they all can be discovered via a central knowledge graph in eBrains and can be accessed securely and in a um, lawful manner by researchers for the um, specific purposes. Um, at the end, uh, this is my final slide. I want to mention that, of course, uh, there is uh, a lot of future development. Yeah, uh, there's a long past, but there's also a future ahead of us. And one big project that just started with eBrains with having a central role in is a testing and experimentation facility for health AI and robotics, TEFELS. So this is a very particular project because it addresses all the services not to the academics, but to the private sector. Yeah, this is a project dedicated to developing these services for the private sector to facilitate validation of new innovative technologies, to facilitate and um, uh, uh, simplify certification, but at the same time um, keeping trustworthiness yeah, um, uh, at, at a very high standard. And um, yeah, we are very happy uh, to be able to connect uh, to the private sector, to um, get in contact with SMEs and startups uh, to build together these services and uh, to deliver them um, for the benefit of the um, patient at the end when the products are trustworthy and come quickly to the market. And uh, yeah, I thank you very much for um, yeah for the attendance, and I'm very happy to get your questions at the end of the session. And uh, looking forward to exchange with you. Thank you very much, Petra, um, for these uh, fascinating uh, discoveries. Um, we are we are running a little bit out of time, but uh, we'll have time for questions. I promise uh, this to the audience. Um, but before that, um, I'd like uh, to introduce uh, Lisbeth uh, Peters um, from uh, Belgium and from the University of Hasselt. Uh, Lisbeth is um, a very enthusiastic researcher uh, specialized in data science and, um, and uh, foc focusing her research on multiple sclerosis data. So she's, uh, she's a passionate uh, ambassador uh, for driving research further in multiple uh, sclerosis. And um, she's also one of the driving forces uh, behind the MS um, uh, Data Alliance uh, community. Um, and in eBrains, she also plays a very important role in uh, not just in, in data sciences, but also in helping uh, eBrains and uh, various researchers develop new solutions because as i was saying in the beginning ebrains is not like set once in for once and for all we 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 want to move forward you know providing um integrated solutions uh to uh, to researchers and making sure that um the tools that we are offering are um bringing as much value as possible for research to go further and faster without reinventing the wheel um, and Nisbet, maybe on that front, um, how do you see this uh, solution orientation within eBrains? What, what do we want to achieve and how will we go about this? I don't think I can hear you, uh, Lisbeth. But if I'm the only one, that's fine. Otherwise, we cannot uh, hear Lisbeth. You may just want to go onto the arrow next to uh, the microphone and maybe switch the microphone functions. Right next to the mute unmute button, there is an arrow 
you can click on it and in the microphone section there is use system setting or use headphones or whatever your device is so play a little bit with those you can switch between them and it should be fine um so and now because i tried a little bit perfect okay perfect <laughs> so yeah what i was going to say is that there uh the word solution uh was actually introduced to um, differentiate the, the different services, which are indeed delivering a very specific uh, a niche user need towards um, actually an integrated framework connecting these different uh, services into a very um, more broader user need. Um, so, and that's why we came with this word of solutions, which is actually defined as integrated set of services to address uh, a more overarching uh, user need. Um, and what we have done for the future roadmap is that we've clustered the solutions a little bit in um, seven main clusters. So there will be solutions around data, around analysis, around modeling, um, focusing on um, data acquisition uh, facilities, uh, neurotech technologies, embodiment, and then really trying to make these things really across all the different solutions into uh, integrated a framework um, and obviously many examples of these user needs have already been given um, but it's specifically as an example um, in the focus of data solutions we will be seeing okay for example the knowledge graph which works already very well as a service where you can find a uh, data sources and you can query metadata, how can we link and integrate the knowledge graph with, for example, more external services or existing repositories so that we can use eBrains as a single point of entry, but redirect them to, for example, other uh, repositories uh, as well. Um, and yeah, when it comes to uh, an analysis, it's also there uh, where we are investigating in our future roadmap, the different analysis workflows. Can we integrate them into as fluently as possible uh, workflows to address uh, the user needs? So, so that's a little bit the introduction of the word solution that is um, really trying to make uh, the future ro roadmap of eBrains even more user driven and even more robust. Um, and I will try to play my role as uh, a solution lead there. And it might fit my personality very well. A PhD student of me once compared me with Rain Man, that instead of just um, throwing in a bunch of matches, uh, I actually connect people. And that is also what I think I can do here, that in a large consortium, I can try to identify the synergies between different research groups and bring these stakeholders together. And through the interaction of collaboration, I hope to inspire them um, to actually make these, these services more user-driven as well as integrated and connected. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yes, I, I, that's that's definitely the one of the rationale of eBrains. It's also to be a central point of connection, you know, uh, between researchers, and and that's absolutely uh, key in our ambition and vision. Do you already have maybe an example of what a specific user community would be making out of you know future solutions uh, mm -hmm. based on your own research or somebody else's research? Yeah, so obviously the examples that have been showed by Peter uh, and Petra, and, and we have the luck that they are here, so um, uh, showcases clearly the potential for uh, the neurotech community, so neurotech as a community, but really also creating impact for uh, individuals suffering with neurodegenerative disorders like blindness. Uh, and it's obviously also my wish that the multiple sclerosis community that I re represent through my work of the Multiple Sclerosis Data Alliance can also be um, uh, gaining from these type of efforts. Um, one of my wish uh, or dreams is that multiple sclerosis as a disease is still quite on an island. And I believe that that is quite the case for also the, neuro, the other neurodegenerative disorders. So, so we form a little bit of clusters around epilepsy, around multiple sclerosis, around Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. 
and I see uh, eBrains a little bit as an umbrella uh, to bring these different uh, uh, clinical communities together so that at least from a technology point of view, they can leverage and learn from each other because the technical challenges are quite similar across the clinical finalities. Um, and it is also my uh, aspiration that eBrains can play the role in bringing the different communities together, but also uh, connecting and bridging towards the more data science complexity, where actually the, the clinical finality doesn't really matter because the technical challenges are quite similar. Okay, yes. Um, any any uh, comment on um, uh, what the what Europe is trying to do with uh, you know the, the the health data space and uh, initiatives that that aim at you know sharing data uh, from a health point of view? I mean, how do you see this? I mean, do you see this as a positive move? And what needs to happen you know to push this further? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Yeah, so obviously I'm a great champion for the European health data space movement, uh, where I do believe that it will probably be as disruptive as the uh, global data protection regulation was in 2018, where the different member states are finally agreeing upon a certain set of guiding principles to safeguard the inherent right of our European citizens that data saves lives, right? Um, and that we should uh, contribute in that space by a set of principles uh, that contribute to that citizen's right. Um, so I do think that also very similarly as the GDPR, the European health data space regulation will be imperfect, but it will also be a first step forward. And I do see a major role of eBrains in that space, where I do think that for now, probably the different European data spaces will still be a little bit in parallel. We can see that there are data spaces arising around clinical data, where, for example, Darwin EU and European Health Data and Evidence Network are taking a leading role. Um, and Elixir, for example, which is also an S3 uh, research infrastructure, is taking the lead in life sciences data, clustering more genomics, proteomics uh, type of data. And I do see eBrains as a single point of entry when it comes to brain-related data uh, to, to solve more neurodegenerative disorders. And that's why I was actually very excited that uh, eBrains together with Elixir um, and some of the leading member states in the European health data space was also involved um, in the pilot that is actually testing some of these first set of guiding principles in practice. Um, and I think that that clearly showcases uh, that eBrains is also recognized in that position uh, to play a leading role in the European health data space. So I'm very excited about that. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it, it is definitely, uh, hopefully this will be, this will bring a, a new breakthrough in, in the way we can leverage the value of, of uh, data. So um, thank you very much, Lisbeth. Uh, I'm checking uh, the chat and the Q&A. But personally, from where I sit, I don't see many questions. So, uh, oh, I see one. Okay. Um, the, so, one of the questions is, can you join eBrains as an individual member, researcher, organization, um, et cetera, et cetera? And um, I don't know who wants to answer. I, I could even answer that one, but uh, I'm not going to. I'm going to leave it to the experts. Um, so maybe Lisbeth, why don't you answer? Because uh, I know you, you know a lot of people who are connecting to eBrains as well. So. Um, so just reformulating the question because I thought it was going to go to Victor. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, uh, is that people can join either as an individual or as an institution, uh, correct? Um, so, uh, so the eBrains research infrastructure, as every other S3 uh, initiative, is a pan-European uh, structured research infrastructure, um, which means that indeed the structure will go through uh, the formation of national nodes that combine different uh, members uh, that are part of the central node. Uh, so, in that sense, joining the eBrains research infrastructure is done through institutions through uh, the national node participation. However, um, the services as well as the solutions are open uh, as much as possible, which means that the use of the services and the tools is being um, 
uh, as open and as open innovation community as possible. So which means that the return of investment or the gain can also be for individual researchers. And we also aspire for that to be as open as possible. Uh, but maybe Victor can uh, complete uh, my answer. Yeah, Victor, I would oh, also like I would if, if you could also step in to the question um, asking if eBrains is a long term infrastructure. I think we can reassure people there. <laughs> Sorry, am I supposed to answer? Yeah. Well, yes. if you don't mind, yes. yes. Giving, yes. Uh, so, is eBrains a long term infrastructure? And, yes. and I think the difference with you know the HBP project and the switch to a long-term research infrastructure is, is an interesting point to make. Um, and also um, becoming a member of eBrains, how easy is it or how, you know, and uh, it's open to everybody. So, yeah. so um, I, I start with uh, Lisbeth's last point, in fact, uh, and we want to re-emphasize that eBrains is accessible for every individual uh, researcher uh, th there are some very minor requirements, such as you need to have an uh, academic email address, etc. But otherwise, it's completely free and everyone is invited. Please join the eBrains community, start using eBrains and contribute to the development of eBrains, because this you can do as a user also. Um, um, uh, uh, Lisbeth already talked about the national notes. Uh, they, uh, there is a national note board, uh, and the individual member states are actually uh, representing the national communities. In addition to this, associated uh, partnership is possible. This uh, uh, is uh, so, uh, and institutions such as universities or research institutes can apply for associate membership, and as such, they will be part of the general assembly and will be able to contribute to the development, so now also to the steering of uh, uh, eBrains. Um, eBrains is a, a long-term infrastructure. It is, uh, so the Human Brain Project is a project. A project has a beginning and an end over a well-defined uh, funding period. Um, and as I said in the beginning, it comes to an end in September 2023. Um, eBrains is not a project. It is an uh, IESBL, uh, so it is a non, uh, not an international not-for-profit organization. This is its uh, uh, legal structure. It is on the S3 roadmap, which makes it a, uh, a strategic priority for Europe. And at the moment, uh, internally in eBrains, we are working on um, different reorganizations of eBrains with regard to this, but uh, it's a legal organization, but it is already now a permanent infrastructure, so the long term is guaranteed. Yeah. Um, uh, Franz, do you want to add something uh, with regard to this or? No, I think uh, this is what, what uh, the, the, sometimes it's a bit confusing because of the HBP connection. So HBP is indeed a project eBrains is a research infrastructure, so it's it's uh, it's there to stay and to offer services to the scientific community. Okay, so um, that's that's the difference between a project and uh, uh, kind of it's not a company, but it's uh, it's uh, an entity that is there to stay. Yeah. Um, so um, I think you were very complete. Uh, there is a question about education. Um, and whether uh, what what kind of education programs um, uh, would be involved in in eBrains, and whether we are planning to have PhD or graduate programs yeah. involved. So um, um, maybe Victor uh, I can you say words to, to this. Yeah. Yep. So first of all, uh, uh, eBrains uh, will not offer any uh, PhD or graduate programs because uh, this is something to be linked with universities, but it can uh, evolve over time together with other academic institutions, but it is a university that awards uh, a PhD. Having said this, education and training is a priority for eBrains. There is a legacy from the Human Brain Project. Uh, we have developed this over the past 10 years. Uh, 
um, a, a systematic educational pro uh, program and reach out to the uh, community. There have been workshops, there have been uh, 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 virtual classes, virtual workshops uh, to train researchers, PhD students, get them familiarized with the eBrains environment. For students, eBrains is a wonderful ecosystem also to use in a teaching environment. You, uh, there are um, uh, additional tools that allow you actually to build uh, individual use cases, which from the training perspective is uh, magnificent. You are able to uh, uh, build individual neurons. You can uh, connect them. You see the effects of the connections when you change uh, a neurotransmitter, either synaptic or non-synaptic uh, uh, transmission parameters. You see the effects. Uh, the physiological effects, you see it in diseases, the pathophysiological effects it has actually for the organization of the brain activity, how it translates into the building of cognitive architectures. So education and training is a priority for eBrains and it will actually determine also our future because it's a new way of performing neuroscience within this particular ecosystem and that goes hand in hand with the new emergent generation of neuroscientists. Yes, thank you very much, Victor. And if I may add, what we are also aiming towards is, is to make these uh, training sessions as hands-on as possible so that people can really, you know, students can really use the tools and get familiar with the tools so they can use them for their own purposes, you know, uh, for research. Now, I see that time is flying. So, Ghana, if you could give me the rights, because I, 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 I would uh, like just to conclude with a few, just with a few words. Um, um, but I would like to start with, uh, you know, thanking uh, our expert speakers for their time, for their uh, passionate presentations, um, very insightful. Uh, to be honest with you, this is not the first time that I've been hearing this, but every time it's fascinating. So uh, thank you very, very much. We were honored uh, to have you uh, with us. Um, uh, and um, I would like to let me just uh, try to find my slide um, to finish, um, um, you know, with a few Okay, so I just cannot uh, find this slide anymore. Um, just just one 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 half second. Uh, other application. Uh, okay, so apparently uh, I cannot. But what I wanted to tell you is, first of all, to all of you, welcome to eBrains. Okay, um, definitely. Uh, we would love uh, for this session to bring you uh, to eBrains and uh, just maybe for discovery. And if you want to discover and try out eBrains tools and services, you just have to connect and register. It is a very easy process. So we would be very happy uh, for you to uh, come and see what uh, the offering is about. Also, if some of you have a scientific question that you're working with, uh, and you're working on for the moment. Um, and if you'd like to know whether eBrains can help you, you know, in, in solving this scientific question, or at least in addressing the scientific question, please don't hesitate to contact us. There is a support button, or you can contact uh, each of us here, and we'll make sure that you get an answer. Also, third opportunity, if you have developed a specific approach, a specific tool, um, that you think is really bringing something to the community and you would like to share it with the community. You know, eBrains is really your reference platform, so don't hesitate. And uh, this might be something the community has been waiting for for a long time, and we would be happy to see with you whether we can share it further and, and uh, make it known to, uh, to the network. And last but not least, if you're thinking of applying for um, a call or submit a proposal to a European or national call, um, 
please, and if you think that eBrains can can help you, you know, in in your research proposal, and if you can work together on this proposal, reach out to us as well, and uh, we'll be happy to see how we could support you or how we could work together with you. So that's what I wanted to end with. Um, sorry, I couldn't get access to the slide for some bizarre reason. Um, but I'm, um, I would like to thank everybody for your attendance. And again, uh, I would like to uh, wish you a very warm welcome onto the eBrains platform. Thank you very much.